All right. Um, so I'm going to describe uh, solar cells the way I see them. I did spend five years of my career uh, studying, learning about solar cells. And um, uh, so uh, it was a very interesting period. I had complete freedom uh, at Exxon to do anything I wanted uh, in that area. And uh, so uh, as long as they were interested, it was OK. But then when they lost interest, I moved on. And, um, but I learned a tremendous amount. I think one of the things about making a significant contribution to a field is very, uh, it's, it's very much easier if you're in at an early stage uh, when uh, a lot of the ideas still ha are waiting to be discovered. So let's just see. This is just a little propaganda slide uh, showing uh, <laughs> solar panels. And uh, this one is kind of a shocking slide to me. Uh, I was in this industry when it was about a $100 million a year industry. And uh, the, uh, the number of megawatts, megawatts installed per year. And back then, it was like 5 megawatts a year was a good year, 10 megawatts a year. And you see now it's measured in, in gigawatts. Actually, in 2010, um, it was over 10 gigawatts. I thought it was only 10. I was in Germany last year. And I, I said, well, it looks like there are going to be 10 gigawatts installed worldwide this year. And they said, oh, no, 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 we're just in Germany alone, we're installing 10 gigawatts. So it's uh, quite substantial. So probably um, the, um, the world market uh, last year was uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, 14 gigawatts of that order. But to give you an idea, the panels are costing about uh, $2 a watt. And so what it means is that as an industry, it's already uh, a 25 to $30 billion a year industry which is very shocking to me because I was there when it was, it was very, very small. And, and these numbers are just ridiculously high uh, and, and, and growing a lot. And I, let's talk about what's happened in this industry. So I remember uh, the first thing I did uh, when I got into this field, there was a conference, the Photovoltaic Specialist Conference. It was in January of 1980. It was in San Diego. And the plenary speaker was from the Department of Energy. And he said, uh, our official Department of Energy goals are to reduce the cost of uh, silicon solar panels uh, from $10 a watt, which is what it was back in uh, 1980 or 81, uh, to reduce it to 50 cents to a dollar a watt within 10 years. So that would have been uh, by 1990. And I remember I was sitting in the audience listening to that, and I shook my head. They're going to have the same technology they've always had, and they somehow they're going to get a, a cost reduction. Uh, by uh, at least a factor of 10. And I shook my head and I said, no, no way that's going to happen. Certainly not within 10 years. And it did not happen within 10 years. It took uh, quite a bit longer. Uh, but I'll let you judge to what extent it has uh, already uh, happened. So let's just look at this curve. So the price was $10 a watt. Now we go to today, 2011. And the price is uh, slightly over a dollar um, a, a peak watt. And um, that's a tenfold reduction. So this is kind of impressive. Now, sometimes you ask people and they say, sure, uh, uh, things get cheaper as, as time goes by. You get better at it. And uh, so, uh, but it's not automatic because I can identify the specific technical uh, innovations that made the cost come down. It didn't come down automatically. It came down because people thought of more clever and more efficient ways of doing things. Uh, so the price has gone down by a factor of 10. It's, not, it's, a, it's, a, it's close to a dollar a watt now. So you say, well, that's great. But wait a minute. The dollar is not what it used to be. OK? <laughs> 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 so there's a factor 3 in uh, the dollar is probably a third of what it used to be. And so it's, what it means is that over the past 30 years, the, um, uh, the silicon solar panels have improved in price by a factor 30. That is a very respectable degree of improvement. Now, it, it, it didn't just happen because the volumes went up. It happened because they, they got smarter. For example, uh, the, the, uh, the purification of silicon uh, involves a, a chemical vapor deposition step. And it's very slow. And, uh, it, takes, and, it, it, and it has a heated rod that's sitting at 1,100 degrees centigrade. And it's radiating energy. And uh, it uh, sits there for two weeks, and it gradually grows into a polycrystalline bool. And uh, boy, that was, that was the least efficient part of the whole process. Very slow, so it was capital intensive. 
uh, used a huge amount of electricity because it sat there radiating energy. What did they do? Uh, they uh, started crowding many of these rods together so they were intercepting each other's radiation. They surrounded the whole thing with a thermal reflector and the uh, uh, electrical energy cost went down and they had many more rods so they got more productivity uh, per chamber and so forth. So there were substantial things. The, the cost of polysilicon uh, went from $60 a kilogram back then and then five years ago before the bubble it was down to $20 a kilogram which is a factor of three improvement just in the cost of the highly purified silicon. Um, but uh, the, and then the, you throw another factor of three for the dollar. So it was a nine time reduction in material cost. That, that's a really tangible improvement. So many things have improved. It, it is not automatic. It is the result of uh, very good engineering and, and very clever stuff. Now, uh, so now I'm gonna, that's where we are today. So let me project into the future a little bit. And as you project into the future, the easiest thing is just to look at this exponential fall, just project the line a, a little bit further. So we project the line down. Uh, and I'd like to project it to about uh, 2020. So in 2020, uh, the projection is uh, that uh, whereas today we have 40 gigawatts installed worldwide, by 2020 we will have uh, a, a terawatt installed worldwide cumulative. Okay, and that during this period of time, around 2016, uh, the, there will be no further need for subsidies because there will be enough cost reductions that the industry will have enough momentum uh, without uh, any uh, subsidies. And then past 2020, w there are specific things we know that are doable that will reduce the cost further. Uh, for example, um, uh, the, uh, the we now know how to peel silicon off of uh, off of a boule. We can actually peel layers off just, just the thickness you need for a solar cell. So there's nothing wasted in the cutting and in, in the saw blade, which is today uh, a lot of it is wasted in the uh, thickness of the uh, saw. Uh, so uh, it's, it's looking very, very good for the solar industry. In fact, th there is one thing I would like to say. Uh, people argue, oh, is it going to be cost competitive with coal? I said, look, that, that's no longer the question because it, it will be. You look at these prices, I guess the projection is 30 cents a peak watt uh, somewhere around 2020. And uh, it's no longer competing with coal. It's really competing with other solar technologies at that point. Because the product is, is somewhat different from coal. It's not on all the day and it, it, has, uh, it has a different profile. So you're, you're not going to compete with coal. You're going to compete with other solar technologies. And the way uh, utilities work, there is implicit storage in the utility because they have diverse sources. And so it is expected that 20% uh, of the, that you can have 20% penetration into the worldwide electricity grid before you have to uh, really worry about storing uh, the uh, energy. So uh, it's looking quite good because 20% of the world electricity is really a very big industry. Okay, so let me go on. Now I, I will gradually, I'll get a little bit more controversial as I go forward. Uh, so here is a, um, a slide. Um, that is the, essentially the cost of ownership or the cost of the, the electricity. And no matter what mathematical formula you use for the cost, the efficiency always ends up in the denominator. So if you want to reduce the cost, there is no choice but to uh, increase the efficiency. And uh, this is a slide I stole from this guy, Alan Barnett, at the University of Delaware. But it's basically, the point is made, the cheapest electricity is the electricity that comes at the highest efficiency. And uh, the reason is the panels are going down in cost. And at the end of the day, it's, uh, you're not going to be competing on the cost of the panels. You'll be competing on the efficiency because you'll still have construction cost. You'll still have the cost of the glass, the, uh, the, the cost of the wiring. Uh, all of these things are pretty similar for the different solar technologies. And so uh, the efficiency ultimately uh, will win. So you say, well, that's obvious, but I'm sure there's some people in this audience who disagree with me. But even worse than that, Wall Street disagrees with me. Okay, and at, uh, uh, the, uh, you look at two companies that are uh, public companies. Uh, one is SunPower, which is the leading company in making really high efficiency silicon solar panels. And it's led by, it was founded by probably the smartest guy in this field, uh, Dick Swanson. And uh, they have a market cap of around one and a half billion dollars. Whereas, uh, and, and they, they uh, are in mass production at 23% efficiency at the cell level and a panel level a little bit less, uh, versus First Solar, which has a market cap 10 times higher and uh, is very proud of producing 11% efficient panels. And so 
Uh, obviously, uh, I must be wrong, at least according to Wall Street, that efficiency is going to be the ultimate uh, decisive factor. But it's controversial. And this, I have spent uh, a good part of my career arguing this point. Uh, when I was at Exxon, we had um, uh, business people and MBAs, and they would analyze everything. And it always come back, no, no, we, we need higher efficiency. And yet most of the researchers were working on amorphous silicon. And uh, it was like a tug of war. So maybe you should change. Maybe we, we need to work on something with higher efficiency. So to this day, that tug of war continues. And it, you can take sides. You can go and buy shares. You can, you can choose to buy sun power, or you can choose to buy first solar. You can vote in that way. So it is controversial, but I come down very strongly on efficiency. OK, so uh, next thing I'd like to, uh, by the way, anyone want to comment on the efficiency question? You can interrupt at any time. OK, so uh, it'll, it'll come back. Let, let's go on. So what is a solar cell? Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, give you my version of what is a solar cell. And it, it does not require a PN junction. So it is not true that solar cells require. You can have a PN junction, but that's not the essential thing in a solar cell. So the way to think about it, and it might, might be easier to think of this as a piece of uh, crystalline silicon. Uh, it could be any semiconductor. And it's, a, it's kind of a rectangular box here. And the box is coated with a wider band gap material. So if this was silicon, the wider band gap material would be uh, silicon dioxide. And uh, what you're trying to make is a bucket for electrons and holes. And just think you have a bucket, and you're standing out in the rain, and you're trying to collect the raindrops in the bucket. And you'd like to build up as big a pressure head in the bucket as possible so you can use it to uh, produce work. So in the same way, instead of raindrops, we have photons coming in, and they're producing electrons and holes. And we'd like to build up the highest possible density of electrons and holes uh, because uh, when you have uh, something with a high density, uh, free energy goes as kT a log of density. I'll, I'll, I'll show you that later. Um, so uh, you're trying to keep the electrons and holes in there so you can build up a great density of them. So you have to prevent them from recombining. And the most obvious place for them to recombine is at the surfaces. So you have to coat uh, the surfaces with a, a wider band gap material in such a form that at the interface, there are very few dangling bonds because the dangling bonds are exactly where uh, the electrons and holes would recombine. So the dangling bonds would catalyze the recombination of electrons and holes. So you have to put on a coating that has no uh, dangling bonds. And uh, so this is an example. But this, I was just talking with Herb before, uh, uh, before the talk, uh, that uh, this is really uh, the double heterostructure concept. Um, and just like in a laser, you need to build up a very high density to reach laser threshold. In a solar cell, you also have to build up a very high density because that's, that's what gives you a very high voltage. Uh, so, so far, no PN junction. Let's go on. Now you've built up the high density of electrons and holes. Now you need one more thing. You need a selective electrical contact. And uh, luckily, in metallurgy, there are ways of making contacts uh, that uh, only allow holes to pass. So you make a p-type contact there, an n-type contact there. And this tremendous uh, uh, density of electrons and holes that you built up in this bucket, uh, now the electrons go through their contact, the holes go through their contact, and uh, they each go out at a separate uh, uh, voltage. Why? Well, uh, the, the great thing about semiconductors, you can have not just one Fermi level, but two Fermi levels, a separate Fermi level for electrons and holes. And that represents essentially the voltage of the electrons. So this wire is essentially connected right here. And the other wire is connected uh, to the other uh, quasi-Fermi level. And the difference between these is the output voltage uh, that you get. And, and you'll see later that the voltage goes as kT log of the uh, carrier density. Uh, so that's, that's how a solar cell uh, works. And I say, well, how are you going to drive the electrons to go to their con? How are they going to know to go to their contact? And, uh, and likewise for the holes. Well, it doesn't take much of a density gradient to push the electrons toward their contact and the holes toward their contact. And if you ask, oh, what kind of a density gradient do you need? It's just a few percent density gradient is enough to push the current through. And a few percent means you're going to lose a millivolt, uh, which is pretty negligible. So moving the carriers around is not a problem. Uh, a millivolt out of a, a one volt uh, solar cell is, uh, is quite, 
quite a, a small amount. So this is a, an important slide because uh, you're all supposed to actually know how a solar cell works by this. Think the analogy with a bucket. You're trying to build up a high, as high a pressure head in the bucket. Uh, the walls of the bucket might leak. That surface recombination. Uh, the the the, uh, the bottom of the bucket might leak. That's bulk recombination, and so it's, it's a great analogy. Uh, I wish I had a picture for that. Okay. Now, wh what about the selective contact? Um, well, here at Santa Barbara, you guys know all about the heterojunctions and selective contacts. So, for example, a selective contact for electrons, all you need to do is have a heterojunction with a barrier for holes, and uh, likewise, you have a barrier for electrons if you want to make a uh, contact to the hole. So there are ways of um, uh, making uh, uh, contact just to one or the other carrier. In fact, it's pretty common in ohmic contacts just to have uh, one type. Uh, so uh, now you're sort of uh, set for the basics of solar cells. Uh, let me then deal with the three important uh, things that influence the efficiency. And that would be the uh, fill factor, uh, the voltage, and the current. And each one of them is, is quite fascinating in its own right. Now, obviously, we want the most of each. First, I need to explain what the fill factor is. So when you have a, a solar cell, uh, the IV curve resembles the IV curve of a PN junction, which looks something like this. But it's shifted down because you're supplying uh, extra current uh, from the sun. So, but the IV curve uh, looks the same. It's just shifted uh, down. And now you have current and voltage in the third quadrant. And so you can simultaneously produce current and voltage. So the third quadrant, you actually produce energy. Uh, now, uh, this part, uh, like a lot of things about solar cells, have a lot to do with thermodynamics. Say, so, well, why should the electrons and holes go into the wires? In thermodynamics, you, nothing is ever 100%. Uh, you have, yeah, most likely they'll go into the wires, but there's always a probability of maybe they won't go into the wires. And so because of that, uh, you, uh, uh, you don't always collect all of your current at exactly the point at which uh, you have uh, uh, the most voltage. So let's say you're at this point. Uh, well, yes, you got, you're getting 100% of the carriers, but guess what? No voltage. Or here, uh, you have 100% of the voltage, but no carriers. So this is not simply a property of IV curves. It's really part of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. It says that you can't have 100% of one or the other. And so there's some middle point here where you get the, the product of the current times voltage is maximized. And so, so this ratio, this, the area of this rectangle versus the area of the bigger rectangle is called the fill factor. And uh, it, you, you might say, oh, that has to do with IV curves. It's a device property. I say, no, it's not a device property. It's a thermodynamic property. And in a very ideal case, uh, you can hope to, to maybe get 89% uh, of the, uh, of the uh, impossible energy. The impossible is to get the open circuit voltage times the short circuit current. No, you have to compromise. And so uh, it's, the, it's the ratio of the area of the smaller rectangle to the bigger rectangle. And that's OK, because no one is going to begrudge you if you're still getting 89% of what you were hoping. So that's pretty good. Uh, so I'm not going to say anything more about the fill factor, except it's fundamental. It is not, uh, it should not be thought of uh, purely as a. 89% is the uh, Yes, it's controlled by thermodynamics. It is influenced by the, ba the actual band gap. The, the, I can give you the formula. I, I think I have a formula later. Uh, and um, uh, so let's just go on. What about current? Obviously, you want to um, absorb all the light. And uh, the first thing you notice is you're probably better off doing this with a direct gap semiconductor versus an indirect gap semiconductor. And uh, so that's kind of obvious that you want to absorb uh, all the light in as thin a layer as possible. Uh, however, a, uh, a little uh, problem occurs. And let me illustrate the problem uh, this way. Suppose you have a plain parallel semiconductor slab and say, aha, it's very good. I have light coming in. It refracts because the refractive index of semiconductors tends to be rather high and then refracts back out again. And this is typically how people used to make uh, solar cells. Uh, but you see, there, there's something bad about this because you have only a single pass of light. And uh, all the old solar panels used to be made that way. However, suppose you would make one of the surfaces rough. Now, here I've made both surfaces rough. But even if one surface is rough, it would get the job done. Because here's what could happen. 
uh, the light refracts in, it bounces at some weird angle, and now it's not so easy to escape because the escape cone in a semiconductor is extremely narrow owing to the high refractive index. I think people are accustomed to a refractive index of one and a half. That's the refractive index of glass. Well, a typical semiconductor has a refractive index of three and a half. And so the escape cone is, o is only about 14 degrees. And uh, if you uh, uh, think about that, oh my god, I have to hit exactly within 14 degrees to escape. And so it doesn't escape. And it bounces again. And it bounces many times. And then the internal path length is increased. And if you do a little calculation regarding the increase in the internal path length, it's four times refractive index squared. That still sounds, oh, that's a number of, of order of magnitude unity. Well, you're not quite, because index squared, three and a half squared is 12 times four, it's roughly 50. So uh, the path length is increased by a huge amount. This means that you can make your semiconductors 50 times thinner. Use 50 times uh, less expensive material, absorb more light, and because you would be concentrating the same number of carriers in a smaller volume, you actually, and uh, this, is, this is one that uh, I probably should have published more, but it's it, kT log of 4n squared. You actually get an increase of voltage of kT log of 4n squared, which is at the operating point. So it, it's a big increase in voltage. It's about 4 kT. So the, a huge benefits accrue when you recognize that it's possible to trap the light in, in the uh, semiconductor. And in fact, uh, the same issue arises in uh, light emitting diodes, uh, which I think uh, people here are very familiar with. And that is, if you have a plain parallel light emitting diode, uh, only a small percentage escapes, perhaps as little as 2%. And then the, uh, the rest of it is trapped and bounces around and eventually gets wasted in some absorber. And so this is a very naive LED. And uh, however, if you make the surface of e even one surface of the LED rough, eventually all the light escapes. And so it's sort of a, an indication the solar cell and the light emitting diode are brothers. They're really the same device. One is run backwards and one is run forwards. And, uh, but they both benefit from uh, breaking the plane parallel symmetry of, of, a, of a thin slab. OK, so now we go back to literally child's play. And we, I'm going to talk about shapes. And this is, uh, you have to imagine you're back in um, kindergarten and they're teaching you about shapes. Uh, of course, I was in graduate school when I learned about this. Not about the shapes, but this word ergodic. So I took a course on statistical mechanics, and the, the professor explained what is ergodic. And boy, was that confusing. And I said to myself, thank God, I will probably never have to use that term in my life. <laughs> OK, and, and so on. But uh, it w we find we have to use it here for the solar cell application. So let me show you the shapes that I call non-ergodic. Uh, let's say, well, we did the rectangle. The rectangle means the light passes through one time, and it does not have access to all these other angles. There's a gigantic internal phase space. Uh, you don't have access to it, OK? Uh, a parallelogram is very similar to a rectangle. A sphere has exactly the same unfortunate property. So a sphere, a light ray goes in, it gets refracted, and is guaranteed to get back out again exactly the same way. So, uh, so these are the non-ergodic shapes. Uh, now, what does this mean? Uh, that means the phase space average is not equal to the time average. So over time, it doesn't help you. You go in, you go out, you're out of luck. You do not access the full internal phase space. Contrast this with the other shapes uh, that you may have learned about. And these are drastically different shapes. These are the ergodic shapes. Uh, a, an ellipse. An ellipse has the property that it traps light. Uh, the parallelogram doesn't, but the trapezoid does. A trapezoid also traps light. So here we have in the uh, shapes that uh, children learn, there's actually uh, a categorization into two distinctly different categories. In the ergodic shapes, uh, the phase space average is the same as the time average. So if you follow it with over time, you will fill the internal phase space. And uh, you'll get a, a big internal light intensity. And whereas things like the sphere are uh, non-ergodic. And uh, now you might say this is terribly obvious, but I'll give you an example. Uh, now for this, I, I, I have to ask you to think about a very artistic shaped piece of glass. Now, uh, the, um, 
in the old days when smoking was politically correct, we used to have ashtrays that had our very artistic shapes to them. And so I, I would ask you, imagine you go out in the parking lot, you have a plain piece of window glass, and you have a glass ashtray. Okay? And what this is saying is how many suns, I'm asking how many suns are there inside the glass? And uh, so if it's an ordinary piece of window glass, you have one sun. The light rays go in, they go back, back out again. If I take a glass ashtray that has a very artistic shape to it, and I'm standing out in the parking lot, uh, that will have uh, maybe uh, 10 suns, maybe, uh, uh, maybe more if it has a higher index. So th th it, there's a huge qualitative difference, uh, geometrical, and where if you, have, if you just break the plane parallel symmetry, you get a tremendous internal concentration of sunlight. And so that, that's kind of amazing because the refractive index is, is really high for semiconductors, so it makes a huge difference. So this, it's this 4n squared factor. So where did it come from? So look at statistical mechanics, and it's really all about statistical mechanics. You look at the density of optical modes. This is the formula for the density of optical modes. If you're in a material with a high refractive index, you have n squared. So that's where you get your, your first n squared. Then you get another factor of 2 from double pass. And you get another factor of 2 because if you're at an oblique angle, you have to average cosine theta. And that averages out to uh, um, 1 over cosine theta averages out to 2. So the net benefit 2 times 2 times n squared is 4n squared. So it's a very substantial benefit. And um, it's, uh, so I, I mentioned what the benefits were, uh, less material, more current, and more voltage, okay? But the English language fails us a little bit, and for the following reason. The way that the light is trapped is by total internal reflection. But everybody knows on a solar cell, you have to put an anti-reflection coating. So we have this language contradiction. We have total internal reflection. Oh, that must be defeated by the anti-reflection coating. And uh, the answer is not at all. The two are completely compatible. And uh, the reason is the anti-reflection coating only applies to those rays that are within the escape cone. Uh, so uh, there you better have an anti-reflection coating. But for the rays that we're going to get totally internally reflected, nothing helps. Uh, the anti-reflection coating has no effect. The uh, total internal reflection just depends upon the overall difference in refractive index between the, the uh, active volume of the solar cell and the external world. The external world is index 1. And so, uh, yes, uh, an ideal solar cell has both total internal reflection and an anti-reflection coating. Uh, so uh, this is sort of uh, a picture of this. And, and part of it is very much influenced by the nature of the resource of sunlight. So there have been many, many papers that have been published how you can do better than 4n squared but then you need to know the exact angle at which the sunlight is coming from. And uh, the nature of the resource is that we do not really know the angle of the sun. We say, well, I, you certainly do. The sun is at a certain point in the sky. But uh, only uh, maybe 60% of the uh, sunlight is coming directly from the sun. The rest of the sky is all lit up also. And that has 30 40% of the sunlight. So you, you have to uh, do this in such a way that uh, whatever uh, texture or trick you put on it, uh, you have to be able to accept uh, light from all angles. So there's a very simple statistical mechanical argument that says you can never do better than a randomly rough surface. And nonetheless, uh, the, uh, since I proposed this, uh, uh, it, it's uh, almost 30 years ago, there have been countless papers on they're going to beat the 4n squared limit. And they're going to have some kind of very clever geometry. But it all, almost always ends up uh, that uh, they are, uh, they've s s somehow restricted the acceptance angle uh, for the sunlight. However, I do get another question uh, very often. Can a photonic crystal do better than a randomly rough surface? Well, in geometrical optics, no, because th there's a simple theorem that says uh, the randomly rough surface is the best. But we're headed toward extraordinarily thin solar cells that are thinner than half a wavelength. You're in the wave optics limit. The geometrical optics argument does not apply. And almost inevitably, uh, there will probably someone will discover a particular photonic crystal pattern that is ideal for trapping uh, sunlight in the wave optics limit in very, very thin cells. And uh, that's a very active 
area of research right now. Um, uh, I'm told that there are four internally competing groups at Stanford aiming to answer this particular question. Uh, there's a very powerful group at MIT and so forth. So there's a lot of interest in, um, in answering the question, what is the ideal surface on a, on a, um, in the wave optics limit? Okay, so that's what I have to say about current. Is, okay, now, um, what about voltage? Well, um, uh, the voltage is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, that little thermodynamic formula that had to do with the fill factor, here it is. It basically depends upon logarithm of the open circuit voltage over KT. It's very much a thermodynamic formula. This is what gave us the 89% fill factor. The 89% is the uh, exact number for gallium arsenide. Okay, so uh, uh, w the, the thing to understand about this is that uh, you operate the solar cell. Uh, let's say you, you're, you started operating the solar cell at open circuit. And so none of the carriers uh, get collected and you have, you have a very big uh, voltage. Say, well, how am I ever going to convince the carriers to move into the wires? They're sitting pretty inside the solar cell. So to convince them to go into the wires, you have to give up a few KT. And that's, that's enough motivation for 98% of the current to go into the wires. That is the optimum operating point for a solar cell. So there's never an issue about uh, collecting the current. You can always give up voltage in such a way that you will collect the current that is, is available. And that's what uh, led to the fill factor that we talked about. But let's talk more generally about open circuit voltage. And um, there's a very simple formula to get the open circuit voltage. Now, it's, it's a little bit harder. It's not as easy as collecting current. Collecting current is just bookkeeping. You, you, just, uh, uh, you just count them up and, and then you hope to collect them. Voltage, you have to actually understand something, but it's not that hard because you can start with the Boltzmann factor. So if you, have, if you believe in the Boltzmann factor, so I have here on the right-hand side, I have my Boltzmann factor with a, uh, allow me to put a free energy up there. And uh, well, it says probability, the probably be a probability of being excited. So indeed, uh, the, the formula for the voltage or the free energy is the ratio of excited state population in the uh, light divided by the uh, excited state population in the dark. And even in the dark, there's a small number of excited uh, state uh, of excited uh, electrons and holes. Uh, so uh, in fact, this is the formula. So you can invert the formula, inv invert the exponential. So you get a log. That's why logarithms appear all the time. And this is the same formula just written out as a log. KT log of a ratio of probabilities is what the uh, voltage is. And indeed, this gives you the expected free energy from, let's say, um, uh, uh, dye molecules. You, you, you can do things with dye molecules and uh, you get this free energy. Or indeed, this is actually the accurate formula for photosynthesis as well. Uh, now, uh, however, you start reading in the semiconductor books, it's the same formula, but there's a factor two. And I was very puzzled by this factor two. And I was uh, a young guy. Uh, but I was working at Exxon at the time, is the way Claude gave my biography. And at that time, uh, Bob Schrieffer was a Nobel laureate and a very high-priced consultant uh, at Exxon. Now, what happens when you're a Nobel, Nobel laureate and a high-priced consultant, you get a very big consulting fee. But on the flip side, you have to actually go to the management presentations, and it's incredibly boring. Okay? And I was like a very, the lowest level manager, so I had to go too. And so I was sitting in the back row, myself and Bob Schrieffer, and, and, I, and I caught him off guard. We were both sort of like really tuned out because we weren't interested in the presentations. And uh, I said to him, Bob, how come the formula is different for dye molecules than it is for semiconductors? It's extra factor two. Now, Bob is not a solar cell guy. In fact, I caught him completely off guard. And uh, it, he thinks about it for 15 seconds. And he whispers the answer to me. And he says, well, when you have a dye molecule, the electron hole have to sit right on top of each other because you have an excited molecule. If you have a semiconductor, they individually uh, explore the phase space. So the phase space is twice as big. And indeed, that is the correct explanation. Okay. And that, that's, so that, uh, that was very impressive to me because I was stumped uh, on this. And he got it within 15 seconds. And uh, without warning, without preparation, without studying up, 
or anything. So it's, it, is, it is kind of remarkable. So it, it's this mechanics definitely controls the voltage. Uh, and, and so this, is, this was embraced uh, uh, by uh, Shockley. Shockley figured all this stuff out. And this is another way of writing the same formula. It's the natural log of the incoming sunlight versus the internal emission in the semiconductor. So, so how can a, a, a dark, cold semiconductor emit? Yes, there's always a little tiny uh, amount of light emission. It, maybe it's, it's one photon for every 10 seconds, but uh, it's that ratio. It's like a ratio of probabilities. Uh, the sunlight versus the small amount of background light emission. That determines the open circuit voltage. So uh, that's kind of nice, and it's beautiful, and it's elegant. Uh, now, I'm going to try to explain it in a slightly different way, okay? And I'm going to say, if, if you need to figure out the expected voltage from a solar cell, uh, I'm going to show you how to do this. Now, uh, first of all, you have to accept the idea that photons have entropy. Now, that doesn't come up very often, but there are books you can actually look this up. Photons do have entropy. And if you have learned your equations of thermodynamics, uh, the free energy of anything is U minus TS. But if it's a photon, the energy is just a normal photon energy minus TS. So it's all about knowing S. What is the entropy per photon? Uh, so statistical mechanics says entropy is K log W. So it's a natural log of the number of different configurations uh, that you could possibly have of the photon. And uh, so that actually tells you the voltage. And uh, let me show you the different forms of entropy that occur. And each of these costs you a little bit of free energy. And the dominant one I have is the first term. So this is the expected voltage. I, I should have written this in VOC equals. And this is it. You start at the band gap. And then you start giving up entropy terms. Now, uh, so what is your dominant entropy term? And it has a very simple physical explanation. Uh, let's say the sun is up in the sky and it subtends an angle of about half a degree in the sky. And uh, so you know the rays are mostly coming from the sun. Okay? But when, at the end of the day, when we make the solar cell, you've completely thrown away all the information of the, direct, the direction that the uh, sun was in because you need the solar cell to accept other directions as well. So you had information and you threw this information away because the solar cell does not use the directivity information, accepts rays from all directions. So there is a, an entropy associated with that. And the number of configurations is pi star radians uh, divided by the solid angle subtended by the sun. And that's actually a lot. That, that ratio is of the order of 50,000. Uh, so you have about 50,000 configurations, because the sun is a pretty small disk in the sky. And uh, those 50,000 con configurations in statistical mechanics, you take natural log of 50,000, uh, and that's around 12, and uh, then multiply by kT. And so immediately, you're losing uh, 280 millivolts uh, uh, just based upon <coughs> this, this known entropy. Now, I get some resistance when I tell this to people. Um, the 4 pi is a very good question. The 4 can appear here, or it can appear here. I've chosen to put the 4 here, OK? Uh, now, I get resistance. Hey, this is a solid state semiconductor device. What does it care about astrophysics? Okay, so why should the voltage be determined by an astro uh, something that has to do with astrophysics, like the solid angle uh, subtended by the sun? But th that's what it is. And it's not purely solid state. It's also the nature of the resource that's coming in. So the resource that's coming in, that is actually the biggest entropy term you have. Let me go on to the other entropy terms. I talked a lot about 4n squared. Now, suppose you take no advantage and you're totally ignorant of this 4n squared. That represents even a smaller internal angle because when, when the sun refracts on the way into the semiconductor, that solid angle is even smaller. And uh, so either you take advantage of that with light trapping or you don't. If you fail to do the light trapping, you'll lose a tenth of a volt. That was the uh, kT log of 4n squared term. So there's another tenth of a volt you give up. Okay. Now, uh, then there's another tenth of a volt. Uh, it's, it's the one that you have to give the electrons and holes a reason to go into the wires rather than simply staying inside the semiconductor. And uh, so that reason, I, I went over it with you. It's, it is the ratio of the uh, operating point voltage divided by 
uh, kT. So it's, an, it's another typical uh, thermodynamic uh, ratio, um, roughly a kT log of 40. And so, uh, okay, roughly another tenth of a volt. Okay, let's go on. Then you lose if you're not, if you don't have the ideal situation. So the ideal situation, the best semiconductor would be material that luminesces well. This was actually pointed out by Shockley. And, and, and this was the basis of the Shockley theory for the uh, open circuit voltage. And uh, what he said is if you have a solar cell with no non-radiative recombination, that means that if you're at open circuit, all, every photon will come back at you as luminescence because it has no place to go. There's no non-radiative recombination. So that, that's the ideal situation, 100% luminescence efficiency. But we don't often have that. Often we have extremely low. And, and there are many types of solar cells. The people who work on them are not even aware of their uh, external luminescence efficiency. And so uh, let's say it's 10 to the minus 5, which it could easily be for certain very poor quality solar cells. So kT log of 10 to the minus 5 is, um, is a, it could be as much as 3 tenths of a volt. So you're losing, you keep losing and end up with pretty low voltage. And then here's another term. This is a correction for the optical mode density. These t this term is of order of magnitude unity. It's only a 20 millivolt term. But these, the, now I've broken down the, uh, the voltage of a solar cell. You start at the band gap and you give up a lot of entropy terms. Now, where did this come from? So this, this approach actually came from a graduate student at Berkeley. His name is uh, Mr. Ross. And in 1967, he was a, a graduate student of Melvin Calvin at Berkeley. Calvin was trying to figure out the uh, physics of photosynthesis. And uh, as part of it, uh, he ended up using the uh, Shockley's uh, thermodynamic theory of solar cells. Indeed, it's the same theory. You're producing free energy in photosynthesis. You're producing uh, free energy in a solar cell. It's, re it's really the same thing. And Ross wrote it out this way, in breaking it up into separate entropy terms. It's very, very beautiful. And so if you're wondering about that, you can go look up that paper. But th there's something very important we learned from this. And I will contrast this with wh when I got into solar cells, I went to the experts and I asked them, how do I know what voltage to expect on the solar cell? And they say, please expect two-thirds of the band gap. Now, that's wrong. That's wrong. It, it is the band gap minus a certain amount. So let's say you're at silicon. You have a band gap of 1.1 EV. And if you add up all those entropy terms that, that I gave you, oh my god, uh, you're down uh, eight tenths of a volt. And so out of all those big photons, you end up correcting for all the entropies and so on. You end up with only a lousy three tenths of a volt at the operating point uh, from all those big photons. And so this is sort of a lesson. Uh, it's, it's sort of a number of different lessons. It is not smart to start to do a lot with the infrared photons. Because you're subtracting the entropy term, it says there's simply not that much free energy in the infrared photons. And I meet people and say, well, I want to do up conversion of the infrared photons. And I say, don't bother. There's simply not that much free energy. On the other hand, look at the blue photon. The blue photons, if you subtract a certain amount, and, and of course the reason why this was so bad is because I assumed a very poor luminescence yield. But even if it's a good silicon solar cell, a really good one, you'd be subtracting 0.5. And uh, so there's, there's quite a uh, penalty there. And uh, what it says is that do a really good job on the blue photons because you subtract 0.5 is still a lot of energy. As opposed to the infrared photons, you subtract 0.5 or 0.8, there's very little left. Now I'll show you more about that. But there's a danger if you pay no attention to the voltage, you could end up with uh, a very poor voltage, which is kind of pathetic. And I claim it's best not to compromise with regard to external fluorescence yield. Okay, so uh, how does a solar cell work then at open circuit? Uh, I'll give you one type of solar cell. Uh, you come in, and let's say it's a really good one. Uh, you, um, uh, you absorb the photon coming in, but guess what? As soon as you absorb it, it has a tendency to re-emit. It re-emits, it bounces around, uh, gets absorbed again, uh, re-emits again, gets absorbed. Why, why does it keep doing this? It's because it's so hard to get out. It's so very hard uh, for the photons to get out. And uh, so uh, you eventually uh, you get out. 
And if you look back at Shockley's formula, it was the external fluorescence that mattered. And, uh, but even when things are going bad with the external fluorescence, you can always lower the voltage and collect all of the current you're entitled to. So at optimum, you're usually collecting about 98% of the uh, current, and then 2% goes, it's just statistical mechanics, goes into uh, losses or other things. It's sort of unavoidable. Um, now, uh, what this says then is that um, obviously if you add a loss mechanism, you lose voltage, uh, but if you get rid of your loss mechanisms and get more of the uh, external light coming back at you as luminescence, uh, the voltage actually increases. So this leads to a very counterintuitive conclusion. It says if you want to make a really terrific solar cell, it should have the best possible external fluorescence, which is certainly counterintuitive. So I'd like to show how this works itself out with sort of new generation uh, solar cells that have extraordinarily high efficiency. And I'm going to describe to you how by taking into account this external fluorescence, we can surpass 25% efficiency. That the physics of solar cells actually, actually changes once you tr are trying to surmount uh, 25. And it should be possible because the Shockley limit is around 33 and a half. So what do you have to do to go above 25? And so uh, I, uh, I showed you this slide already. Uh, and uh, it's, it's what Shockley said, in, under ideal conditions uh, the, uh, at open circuit, the electrons and holes have no place to go, and they come back at you as 100% uh, as luminescence. And this was Shockley's condition. The outgoing luminescence was exactly equal to the incoming solar radiation. Of course, th that is very rare. And the reason why it's rare, it's so hard to get external radiation because only 2% of it escapes on the first bounce, and the rest of it, 98%, could end up being trapped. So this is uh, very unfortunate. And this is sort of a slight generalization then of what Shockley was saying, is that yes, you might be able to get your ideal voltage, but you will pay a price to the degree that you're not fluorescing with 100% external efficiency. And so this is kind of a remarkable formula. I want you to sort of, it's my main point, um, I want you to internalize it a little bit and that is that uh, if you have 1% external fluorescence, yes, you will pay a price in the open circuit voltage. And if you have 10 to minus 5 external fluorescence, the price is even bigger. So you wa if you are hoping to get to the Shockley limit, you better have close, as close to unity external efficiency. A great solar cell also has to be a great LED. So what is the new physics that comes in after you reach 25% efficiency? Let me illustrate it this way. This is the standard way of thinking about a solar cell. Light comes in, gets absorbed, uh, electron is collected, hole is collected, and that's fine. But as you go above 25% efficiency, the picture changes. And this is the new picture above 25% efficiency. Yes, you absorb the sunlight, uh, but then you fluoresce, uh, you get reabsorbed, you, you emit, you bounce around, eventually you escape. And it's the ability to escape that determines how close you will come to the uh, Shockley limit. And in effect, uh, a high efficiency solar cell has an internal photon gas with of luminescent photons with an intensity that is roughly uh, 4n squared times the incident sunlight. So you could have 20, 30, 40 suns inside a one sun solar cell. And that would be the normal operating condition uh, if you're above 25% efficiency. So this is the world uh, below 25% efficiency and it, as you strive to go above, you, you, you need to manage, uh, do a great job managing uh, the photons. Now, why is it so hard to achieve the Shockley limit? Well, because of all the light bouncing around internally, uh, you re you, and you, have to, uh, you, could, you maybe have to recycle the photons many, many times. You might need an internal fluorescence yield of 99% just to get an external yield of only 50%. And so it puts a tremendous burden on the um, internal uh, fluorescence. Uh, another way to look at it is to say the recycled photons are not lost. Therefore, the effective carrier lifetime increases. If the lifetime increases, uh, the carrier density increases and uh, the open circuit voltage is KT 
uh, natural log of the carrier density. So it's another way of saying the same thing. Uh, but it's really hard to do this because you do need this phenomenal internal fluorescence yield just to get a moderate external fluorescence yield. So let me show this to you uh, based on uh, calculations of how important it is to go well beyond 90% internal fluorescence yields. This is the internal fluorescence yield uh, uh, versus the cell efficiency and also the open circuit voltage. Let's look at the open circuit voltage. And this, by the way, was worked out for gallium arsenide, but it's similar for other uh, high efficiency materials. Is it, yes, you help yourself by making the internal fluorescence yield bigger, but the most help is that last little bit as you go from 95 to 99 percent. So you have a tremendous improvement. It is 90 percent is really not enough. And likewise, a tremendous improvement of efficiency uh, just as you uh, approach um, uh, uh, 99 and 100 percent internal fluorescence yield. Same thing with the rear reflector. Uh, very important to have a rear reflector. 90 percent is simply not enough. I mean, it's good, but look at what happens to the voltage. At 90 percent, you have a good voltage. But as you go above 90, 95, 98, 99, you get a tremendous steepening and tremendous increase in the open circuit voltage. And so the lesson of this is that if you're talking about a really good solar cell, don't worry about the transport of the electrons and holes. That's, uh, that's already taken care of. The real issue uh, in, in a really high efficiency solar cell, manage the photons, help them get out. Uh, and uh, have good reflector, have good internal luminescence yield, et cetera. But good means 90% is not enough. It should approach 99 if possible. So this is a, uh, an illustration of uh, the same uh, concept. And uh, it shows the same idea. Uh, you go from 80 to 90% efficiency <coughs> internally. And yes, it helps a little bit. But from 90 to 100, that's where you get your biggest boost. Uh, notice another thing on this graph uh, is that uh, you're more vulnerable with lower band gaps. That, that's my statement. There's not that much free energy in the infrared. So all the infrared photons, you're far more vulnerable. You have a much bigger penalty to pay in the infrared, whereas uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the more visible photons, uh, the penalty is uh, much, much uh, smaller. So already your theoretical efficiency drops to 31 at 90% 90, 90 uh, fluorescence yield. And it's almost all in the voltage. And this shows uh, you have a 80 to 90% fluorescence, a slight improvement in the voltage. Uh, 90 to 100%, a 70 millivolt improvement in voltage. And in fact, the new physics, the, the solar cells that have new physics in them, they have unbelievably high voltages. So um, let's see. This is, uh, I think it's something I said before. Uh, regarding the voltage increase, this 4n squared factor. So this is about light trapping. Let's go beyond light trapping. Uh, this gives you an idea of uh, what to expect. And uh, the, um, uh, the lesson here is that um, uh, it's very important to have a good mirror. So this is a bad mirror versus a good mirror and a very big leap in voltage from 1.08 open circuit to 1.15. I'll show you the actual experiment. The experiment is even more dramatic. What did you assume for the uh, this, uh, this was an ideal calculation of 100% internal quantum efficiency. And the good mirror was a 100% mirror, and the bad mirror was a 0% mirror. So I, I hate to show a table. I tell my students, never show tables. OK, so uh, we're getting close to the end here. So let me tell you what the situation is. For 17 years, the record single junction solar cell was at 25.1 percent. As recently as a year ago, that would be June of 2010, the record had risen to 26.4 percent efficiency. Okay, and um, Alta Devices, which is uh, my uh, company that um, uh, is uh, concentrating on, uh, uh, I shouldn't use the word concentrating; it's confusing. <laughs> it's not con non-concentrated flat plate solar cells. Um, has, has boosted now the record so far to 28.2%. So this is rather gigantic increase uh, over a uh, six to 12 month uh, period. And in fact, it's even more dramatic in terms of the open circuit voltage. A year ago, the record solar cell had an open circuit voltage of 1.03 volts. The new record solar cell 12 months later 
is 1.1 volts, uh, 1.11, an 8 percent increase in voltage. So that's not just doing things better. That's actually changing the physics of the solar cell. The change physics is to capture, uh, recycle the internal photons, help them get out of uh, the, uh, the photovoltaic material. And, and so we're in a new regime of uh, really high efficiency. And where this is headed is definitely, uh, it's not much of an extrapolation to say we're going to get to 30 percent efficiency and then things will slow down because we're reaching the uh, theoretical limit. So this is really uh, quite outstanding for a single junction flat plate cell. Uh, what's going on? Uh, the, it's a lot of it is the um, uh, photon recycling in this case. It's not always photon recycling. Anything you can help, uh, help use to get the light out is very helpful. But to give you an idea, the difference between a good mirror and a bad mirror is the, the bad mirror, the external emission is only 0.04 milliamps. Uh, and a good mirror, the external emission is 0.79 milliamps. So it's all about the external emission. And um, so this is it. This is the, the new so solar cell versus the uh, older solar cell, uh, breaking the 25 percent threshold. Uh, Counterintuitively, to approach the shock equator limit, you need to have phenomenal emission. That's very counterintuitive. But it, it's the emission, the very good external emission is an indicator of very low internal non-radiative losses. And you need to have much greater than 90 percent, both in the internal fluorescence yield and in the reflector. Both are needed to get good external emission. Uh, so this is the point I made earlier. Uh, for solar cells at 25 percent efficiency, the good electron hole transport is given. Above 25 percent, it's all about photon management. And a good solar cell has to be a good LED. Now, you, say, you might say, oh, well, this is great. You're breaking uh, records. Yeah, but that's a very expensive solar cell. So I would say I'll, my last two slides talk about business and costs. Uh, of course, gallium arsenide solar cells are preferred where cost is no obje uh, uh, object that's in space. But it is uh, a mistaken idea to think that uh, gallium arsenide has to be very costly. Uh, for example, the fact that it's a direct band gap material uh, says that uh, uh, the cost can be very low. So uh, this is uh, a, a, a news clipping. I like the title here, so I put it in there. The company was extremely secretive until March. We had our first press release in March, and we revealed that we were using epitaxial liftoff uh, to uh, make the uh, cost of the gallium arsenide very, very low. And uh, this is the epitaxial liftoff process. You use the selectivity of different acids. So this is actually uh, uh, an amazing thing. I'll, I'll put out there as a challenge to uh, us old timers here. If you, uh, you know, before the internet, we had the handbook of chemistry and physics. And in the handbook of chemistry and physics, they list all the inorganic compounds. And they have columns. They list the melting point, the color, and so on. And the last column in the handbook has I or S. So what's I or S? So it's Soluble versus insoluble. It's binary. It's almost binary. Very rarely it'll say slightly soluble. But it's almost all either soluble or insoluble. And this is a remarkable property in nature. I don't think it has been given a theoretical explanation, but it's used in the epitaxial liftoff process. That to think about it, at f you have an al gas alloy at 41 percent aluminum. It's etched by acid, and at 39 percent aluminum, it is not etched. And the and this etch selectivity is at least 100 million to one. And this is kind of amazing. And no theoretical explanation. But it's used in the FTX. You lift off, you come in, and you float off. And you can float off uh, big, big pieces like this. Uh, float them off and handle them as freestanding thin films. And the cost goes away because you then reuse the substrate. And you're only paying for the thin film. And the thin film currently is around a micron, but uh, can be um, uh, as, as little as 100 nanometers and still have the same efficiency or maybe even higher. Uh, so uh, I should tell you one thing. I have, to, I have to go back. I can't resist this. So uh, this was presented. The company presented. Oh, let's go back. Here, this one. Uh, the company presented the, um, uh, the record solar cell at the, um, uh, at the photovoltaic conference in Seattle three weeks ago. And uh, the, um, uh, the voltage was rather eye-popping. And we sent it off for validation by NREL. And the guy who does the validations at NREL 
said, I, my system is out of calibration. I'm getting a voltage of, and possibly high voltage. Okay. So uh, uh, Alta presented this at the voltaic, uh, photovoltaic conference. And the first question from the audience, is this really gallium arsenide? Because the voltage was too high. And uh, then they said, OK, uh, how, how thick is it? Uh, quantum size effect. They must be using very thin layers. No, no, it's a micron thick layer. So it is, uh, it, it is a uh, rather uh, surprisingly high voltage. OK, so this is the way that you make it very inexpensively. And it is, you know, there's now emerging several ways of making uh, thin crystalline films at low cost peeling methods. So you peel, they have now a method of peeling thin silicon off of, off of a bull of silicon. Uh, so the, the, the improvements are going to be there. This is what the uh, gallium arsenide looks like. You lift it off. I don't necessarily recommend, this was published by a group in the Netherlands about 15 years ago. There are many ways of doing this, so I don't say we're necessarily doing it this way. But you end up with uh, thin films, quite flexible like this, and you just sort of uh, work with them. And the cost projects out to be extremely low. And to the degree uh, that, um, uh, that the uh, cost of the panel, I think, will end up being less than the cost of uh, mounting the panel in the field. Uh, the, uh, so it's, and, and this is not, I, I say, this is not just gallium arsenide. You say, what, what do I lose sleep over? They're doing the same damn thing in silicon now. Okay, so how are you going to beat that? If, if single crystal films end up being very low in cost, then it's going to be, uh, it's obviously going to be the preferred way to go. Anyway, I welcome uh, questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> go ahead. Well, uh, let me say that the uh, substrate has a buffer layer grown on it and then a very thin layer of aluminum arsenide. So in some respects, the substrate is, after it's used, is better than the original substrate because it has a buffer layer on it. Okay, uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, I think uh, that it can be reused uh, thousands of times. But Right, and, and, and that's, that's pretty routine now. Yes, please. Isn't the, the advantage of silicon is the silicon oxide? Yes. Now, you were talking about gallium arsenide. How do you combat that? Okay, so it's a very good question. You should ask the person sitting next to you. <laughs> 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 uh, but basically, just as I gave you the example of a silicon solar cell, and then have to be surrounded with a wider band gap material, which was silicon dioxide, and we have the same thing in gallium arsenide. And so we surround it with, for example, aluminum gallium arsenide. And we don't, it's not really surrounded, it's layers. But uh, uh, that's very, very critical to prevent the carriers from recombining at the exposed surfaces. Do you need a, a, a process that is costly compared to just exposing the silicon to air? Well, uh, if you expose silicon to air, this is not actually a good oxide. Well, uh, yeah, so you have, to have, you have to follow a rigorous procedure for oxidizing the silicon, and then you get very good results. In the case of gallium arsenide, there is, uh, there's no added cost because when you grow the gallium arsenide, it, it costs nothing just to open another valve and let a little bit of uh, trimethyl aluminum go in. And so you, it, it, you, you end up, in fact, the real solar cell is actually quite complicated. It has many more layers in it. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the making of the double heterostructure is, uh, uh, does not particularly add cost. Uh, are you talking about the fact that we need a window layer? Oh, um, yes, yes, yeah, the w that's, that's a good point. Uh, there is algas of different alloy compositions on both sides because that is the meaning of a double heterostructure. Go ahead. Um, I don't think so. Um, it's a fundamental thermodynamic limit. Uh, I mean, the way to beat it is to have a multi-junction cell. And uh, it's, still, uh, it's still described by the shockley quiser limit, but now it's a multi-junction cell. The original limit was just done for a single junction cell. 
So a multi-junction cell, it, it's compatible with gallium arsenide. You can add a lot of efficiency. So I don't think it stops at 30%. Uh, we have now uh, multi-junction cells that are over 40%. So uh, I think we can look forward to phenomenal efficiency at very low cost. And uh, at, the Lawrence, at the people at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, I tell them, um, forget about solar cells concentrate on electrically produced fuels because in the middle of the day we're going to have a lot of excess electricity and we need to store it somehow and and it, we need to store it seasonally not just from day to night so we need to create fuels uh, so yes the efficiencies will be much higher the cost will be much lower it's very difficult to see how this doesn't become the uh, lowest primary source of energy in due course You waited so long to make a startup. So why this now a good time? Well, um, I, when I left Exxon in 1984, it, uh, the whole solar field left a bad taste in my mouth because I had put so much effort into it and uh, the world wasn't terribly interested in it. And so I went and I did other things. I had in mind that the time might come, but I, I estimated it would take 25 to 35 years before the time would come again. But in the meantime, uh, the epitaxial liftoff process, which came in roughly, for me, it came in the mid-80s. Uh, it, um, it wasn't perfected. And, and uh, so I, ha I have to share with you a rather strange experience. So Alta was being very secretive up until March, and people were trying to find out about Alta. And uh, what, what happened, and this was actually posted on one of the um, uh, news websites so the, that follows solar, they posted a uh, final technical report that I wrote to the Department of Energy in 1998 uh, that was describing the, our successes and failures with epitaxial liftoff. The, the films were brittle, they would tend to crack, there were a lot of technical issues. But I remember I, I was looking at this news website and I'd clicked on this thing and my technical report popped up. But I hadn't seen it in, in 13 years and I, I said, hmm, those words sound familiar. I wonder if I wrote that. <laughs> And, I, and I, the professors here will under, understand what I'm talking about. The final technical report is the most boring task imaginable. And no one's ever going to read it. You, 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 they're going to at most file it away in a filing cabinet. And um, I, I urge you, please do not read my final technical reports. <laughs> However, this one, I actually put a little bit of effort to make the prose reasonably good. And so it was readable. It was actually a readable report. And good thing, because uh, if you click on my name, uh, that report comes as one of the highest hits. Apparently, people have been, have been downloading that report. And it's all loaded with everything that can go wrong with epitaxial liftoff. So w we needed that time to get the bugs out of it. It's one thing to say you're going to peel a film off. But it's in, if you're going to scale it to mass production, there are a great many issues. And uh, it just wasn't ready at that time. Yeah, non-radiative is very bad. It could come from recombination of traps, but it could also come from having a poor mirror. And both have to be handled. So it's all about the photon management. And, and that's sort of an editorial remark. As you get to a certain level of efficiency, it's about the photon management. It's not so much about the uh, uh, electrons, uh, moving the electrons and holes around. Okay, Okay. Uh, so in that case, uh, the, uh, it was a plain parallel solar cell, which is against what I was telling you, right? Now, the reason why we could get away with a plain parallel solar cell in that case, uh, obviously, we could have absorbed more light if we had trapped it internally, but we didn't. Uh, we, can't, we tried to keep it simple, so it was a plain parallel solar cell. But we did get the voltage benefit. Now, you can get the voltage benefit by trapping light, but we got it for free because the internal fluorescence yield was so high. So the, instead of using roughness to get the angular randomization, 
uh, we used the act of fluorescence to get the angular randomization. So in that way, we could get the voltage boost without any texture on the uh, thin film at all. It's uh, no, it's it, it's absorption, emission, absorption, emission. At different angles. At different angles. Which is why you just use and that's why we get the tenth of a volt benefit without paying the extra effort of texturing. So it was about twenty percent uh, luminescence efficiency. Um, uh, external, yeah, it it's it's it translates to only uh, twenty percent external, which says we have quite a long way to go. Uh, now to get to the twenty percent external. Uh, we probably had 95% internal. We've got to improve the 95 to 97, 98, 99. And, uh, and so the voltage, as high as the voltage was, uh, there's still further improvement. So wasn't it the boost compared to the smart cast technique to get thin uh, yellow mass like in ratios, you can get double, double equal possible with the sun? Um, well, uh, you're, you're looking to the future. Uh, how are we going to compete with improved silicon that is using the peeling method? Now, they're not using SmartCut because that process is a French company, that, as you know, Soitec, and that uses ion implantation, so it's not suitable for mass production. Uh, but we will be competing against really low-cost silicon in the future. We're, you have to face up to the reality of it. And how are we going to differentiate ourselves? And uh, there are probably going to be 10 silicon companies and we're going to be maybe the only gallium arsenide company. It remains to be seen. Uh, they will go down their learning curve faster because they have more volume. Uh, so it's a worry. It's definitely a concern. On, on the other hand, uh, we haven't used our full bag of tricks. We could easily make a dual junction cell and get the efficiency into the 30s. And they are going to be stuck with where they are, probably panel efficiency 20 21% at best, maybe only 20 So we're still looking at a substantial uh, advantage in terms of efficiency. And if I'm right that efficiency is so important uh, that uh, we will uh, end up uh, winning, but it's going to be a struggle. Uh, yes, uh, just like uh, concentration of electrons increases the efficiency, concentration of light also increases the voltage. It's a KT log of the concentration ratio. It's just thermodynamics. So isn't that a simpler way to go than uh, trying to reach the ultimate uh, luminescence efficiency? Um, um, uh, I would say no, because there are things the concentrator people don't tell you. Uh, so uh, one of the things is that uh, maybe only 60 to 70 percent of the light is coming from the disk of the sun. And so as soon as you have a concentrator, you're throwing away all the diffuse light. So all of those really high performance concentrators, in the back of your mind, you should multiply by 0.6 or 0.7. Uh, the, uh, it, it throws away a significant part of the resource. Uh, I would say at this point in time, uh, concentrators are on the defensive. And uh, you, if you cannot get a bank loan for a concentrator array, for example. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, let me say that there was a time when the manufacturing of silicon was very inefficient, and people made the argument that the cost of manufacturing of the silicon was greater than the energy it would produce. Uh, of course, they greatly improved the silicon, and I talked about a 30% reduction in cost, and you can be sure that the energy cost uh, was a big part of that. Uh, but as uh, I would say, uh, the kinds of technologies we're looking at now wi with relatively thin films, it's the energy cost of production is virtually nothing. Okay, well, gallium is not particularly um, expensive or rare, uh, so uh, you can set that aside. Arsenic is pretty bad stuff, but in that case, don't read the label in the gardening store. Because if you buy crabgrass killer, uh, a gardening, so I once bought a, a 50 pound bag of crabgrass killer because I was living in suburban New Jersey and we have big lawns. The 50 pound bag was 14% by weight arsenic. And I was supposed to spread that over the grass where the kids were going to play the following day. 
So I, I would say the amount that is being used is exceptionally tiny. If I would worry about anything at all, it would be if, it, if there's a fire. So if there's a fire, that gets vaporized. And so that could possibly be a problem. But uh, short of that, I, I, I wouldn't worry about it. There's just very, very little uh, being used. I, I realize, yeah, there's irrationality out there, but uh, this is a worldwide industry, and irrationality usually doesn't cross borders. And so there are, there are other, <laughs> other countries that have big markets uh, where uh, they, they might not uh, uh, make a fuss like that. Uh, let me point out, the, the most highly respected uh, company on Wall Street, the solar company, is, is First Solar. That's Cadmium Telluride. Cadmium? Tellurium? So this is this is uh, this is much better. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I think uh, the, the density of states that matters is the density of optical states. And density of optical states is controlled by the refractive index. And the refractive index is almost the same between silicon and gallium arsenide. So uh, in that respect, they're on a, they both have light trapping to the same degree. And they both use light trapping. So uh, of the $25 billion of solar cells, uh, the virtually all of them are using light trapping now. Right, so I, I think I said it before, if the industry is as successful as what I'm saying and the cost goes down as far as I'm saying, uh, we're going to penetrate about 20% into the electrical grid and uh, using the implicit storage of other sources on the electrical grid. Now, to have more penetration than that, you need to have storage. And I, I'm, I, I differ from some people. I, I don't think the day-night storage is as important as the seasonal storage. Uh, where you go from, um, uh, uh, from winter to summer, and there's a obviously a vast difference in the amount of light. Uh, so uh, I've been recommending to Lawrence Berkeley Lab uh, to reactivate. They actually once had uh, a little bit of research on electrically created fuels. And I would say they need to do a lot more. What did you say electrically? Electrically created fuels. So in other words, using electricity to generate fuels. We never do that because fuels today are cheaper than electricity. But we're... That will invert at some point in the future, if I'm right. And that is that at least during the middle of the day, the electricity will be cheaper than the fuels you could make. But there's very little research on electrically created fuels. Uh, the guy who was doing it retired at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, yeah, the, um, uh, the, the effort that is going on today is to produce fuels directly in the solar cell. I think that's misguided because you don't want to have plumbing to the solar. It's bad enough to have wiring to each solar cell, but to have plumbing is, is not really practical. You gather the solar electricity and you use the electricity to create fuels. And uh, there, I think that's a great research area. Uh, but we have to convince the, um, the people who uh, make those decisions to put more money into it. So I think we'll have to stop. Uh, so Eli has to go back to Carmageddon. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's okay thank you. Much.